we're not wired to look for the downsides. We're wired to go, I better do this now because I'm gonna miss out and I gotta jump on that, right? So we systematically remove the bad things so that we're only left with good things. And the people who I see who consistently win in business, they either have a system where they eliminate the downside or they naturally do it and they're just not aware of it. They're not actually huge risk takers when you weigh the, the downside versus the upside. Hey, I'm Joe Fear, and welcome to the Hustle & Flow Chart Podcast. This is where we talk all about building businesses so they give you the freedom and fuel for your life. I'm not here to help you build a billion dollar business, but I am here to help you create a business with systems that work for you so you can make more money than you need just by working part time. You know, I was a chronic hustle mode kind of guy and I wanna share my experiences and mentors I've met along the way to help you reframe things to be the most effective as an entrepreneur. I wish I had this guidance and insight when I was younger, so that's what I'm doing here for you. Please share and enjoy. Hey, hey, on this episode, I'm bringing in a gentleman who shares a very similar mission to what I'm doing here at Hustle and Flow Chart. And, and this is in Dan's words, Dan Nicholson, is that his mission is to end suffering for entrepreneurs. And you'll understand why he has that mission and what to do about that if you feel like you might fall into that bucket. Uh, I have many times. And there's an actionable way out of that that actually flips anxiety, stresses, uncertainty, all of the stuff that leads us to pushing to more and more and overfilling our cup and not figuring out what our enough is. So my conversation with Dan Nicholson, who happens to be also the author of Rigging the Game, how to Achieve Financial Certainty, Navigating Risk, and Make More Money on Your Terms. Get it. Get that book. It's your manual with the solution. It's the thing you need. So go to riggingamazon.com, and that's actually going to take you straight to the checkout with that book there, Rigging the Game. My conversation with Dan was epic. I hope you enjoy it, and please share it with another entrepreneur if you want to help them end some suffering as well, because we all need a little, little good juju while we're navigating this wild life of entrepreneurship. Okay, on to Dan. All right, we are back with another episode, and this time we're finally having Dan Nicholson on the podcast. I think it's been over a year now. Nick Peterson made the intro, your business partner, and mm -hmm. I think the timing is right now, Dan. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Had a shift in the podcast. You have a new book, Rigging the Game. It's great to have you on here, man. Yeah, super excited to chat. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course, and I, I want to I guess I want to start this show off talking to the listeners because this new theme, newish theme of the show is locating and finding enough in our lives, in our business, and how that how we can actually fulfill ourselves through all those means. And there's something interesting, Dan, that you said is, uh, and this was I think a quote from Huberman, Andrew Huberman. Uh, was we're all wired to have more or want more and have that craving. And there's a lot of downsides to that that you really outline well in Rigging the Game, your book and on your podcast. I'll shout that out too. And um, and I feel like you bring a lot of certainty and you bring you bring all that into these quantifiable things and thought processes in a super smart way in this book. Mm -hmm. And I know in all these other things, things you have, but I want to shout out that at the top of the episode is that I feel like this book and is almost like a guide to finding your enough, but also doing it in a in a smart way to achieve all the financial aspects and just changing your thinking in a way that's a lot healthier. Well, Joe, I think you're making a lot of good points about just in particular borrowing from Dr. Andrew Huberman this whole idea that dopamine is the molecule of more. And I'm not a uh, by any means a credential like he is to, to talk about it, but I've certainly felt this throughout my life, just on my professional career, this constant, the next thing, the next thing. And uh, it makes sense if we go back to the early days of humans when we were out there hunting and gathering and you see an opportunity, uh, you have to go for it in that moment. And so it makes sense that we might still biologically feel like every opportunity we have to, we have to capitalize. Otherwise, maybe we're not eating tomorrow. But that's oftentimes no longer the case. And so the challenge when we're constantly chasing more is that we put ourselves in a position often where we might blow ourselves up. In other words, we might actually take ourselves out of the game for a while. And so I talk about trying to reorient to not more is the answer, although sometimes it is. Sometimes you do need to work more. Sometimes you do need to get more clients. Sometimes you do need to hire. But the, the question is, is this decision going to get me closer to what I really want? And so it's about closer, not necessarily like more. Yeah. And it's it's tough. It's a simple thing for me to say, but it's not easy to do in practice. And that definitely, it comes through in the book. And I'll, 
I'll call it an aha, and I think this relates to the fourth commandment, if I'm not mistaken, that you have in the book. You have four commandments. I won't list them all here, but uh, I think we'll probably hit on some during this episode, is something that we're not always seeking the best of ourselves every single day, that there's almost like this rolling average that, that we can pursue so it's getting closer to our goals instead of those PRs every day. Yeah, I started thinking about that because, I, I mean, full disclosure, I'm a recovering people pleaser. I'm a recovering, like, I got to get a 4.0 on everything. So just so people know, that's where I'm coming from. Super competitive, maybe sometimes in the past, that's borderline and being a little bit petty. Uh, so I found myself const- uh, setting expectations on a daily basis based off my maximum output. And it's almost like I used to do a bunch of endurance athletics, like marathons, half Ironman, stuff like that. And if you've ever done any of that type of endurance training, you go out and some days you're just feeling it and you set your personal record. You're like, oh, man, I didn't know I could run that fast. But you know that's a personal record and the next day you don't go out and expect that you're going to run that same race. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a personal record. It'd be so meaningful. But when we set expectations around work, uh, how we're going to show up as maybe parents, as a spouse, how we're going to show up in our relationships, we tend to get anchored to that personal best. One day I got uh, 200 emails responded to and I got all this work done. And so I'm now I'm measuring myself and setting all, all my systems and everything around that personal best. Nine out of 10 days, I go home and I have all this guilt and shame because I can't live up to my personal best. So I suggest an alternative. And this is kind of an essence of trying to rig the game. In other words, engineer the outcome you want, which is set expectations more based off your average or your rolling average. And then uh, so most days now you're going to hit expectations. And in those moments when you are feeling good, that's just engineering extra upside. And it's a small nuance. And again, it's simple, but it's not easy because we're going to keep coming back to what should, what should I be doing? I thought that was, that was a big aha. And I think later as we go through here, some other folks might have that ting even more as an aha because yeah, it takes a lot of pressure off. And that was my feeling through reading your book, Rigging the Game. And it's just, it's almost like an understanding of us as entrepreneurs. We all have this drive to keep pushing for more, but we can reframe that into, I know you say a lot of, it's optimizing for the right thing, of course. It took me a long time to realize how much I had to unlearn as an entrepreneur. I was that cliche kid growing up scheming on business ideas, got an accounting degree and an information systems degree because I thought, okay, that technology, language of business, okay, I'm going to be primed to be a great entrepreneur. And then eventually I started running my own business and doing all the things I learned in business school. Because why wouldn't I? I went to business school. <laughs> and it took me almost a decade, embarrassingly, to realize most of the stuff doesn't work because business school prepares you to work for a Fortune 500 company. That All the rankings for business schools are based off like placements to Fortune 500 companies. So why wouldn't they prepare you for that? But the challenge is Fortune 500 companies, they have one duty, that is to maximize shareholder value. Maximize is right back to more. The most right now, I want the most clients, most employees, the most market share. And they can do that because they have significant resources. My wife worked at Starbucks in recruiting. They had a whole IT department just to support the application that she used in the recruiting department for recruiting store architect. Like <laughs> they have resources. So minute. Yeah. So minute. You're a small business owner. You're like, you take out the trash. You do all the sales and marketing, <laughs> you know, you're doing everything. Yeah. You don't have a whole team for one application. So we have to optimize what's the most efficient path forward to what you want. That's a totally different mental model. And so it means you have to unlearn a lot of the traditional business stuff that's about maximize. Mm, unlearning. I like that. Well, let's, I want to go back because I know you have a, you have a big history in business after business school. And I did business school as well. And a lot of endurance training. You're right. There's a lot of, I see how you relate, you know, how all that stuff relates and you got to unlearn a ton through that, that pushing, pushing. Um, but let's go back to, to you and, and a little bit of your journey of how you got here and, and maybe some of these key points that you really want people to take away of how you did have to, the process of unlearning and, and to this point where we're at now, and then we can dive into I think that traditionally there's kind of two buckets of uh, folks. There's the people who do all the research, and then there's the people who are like, screw it, I'm just going to bet on myself. You know, there's some in between, but there's sort of these two different archetypes of sorts or narratives out there. And I was more of the do all the research. So I was like, you know, the straight A student. And like I said, like obsessing to a point that wasn't healthy about that. And I had this narrative of if I do the work, I'm going to get the outcome. And that's a big part of a lot of... Uh, cultures, especially Western cultures, like you do the work. You're going to be rewarded for the hard effort. 
You know, I got a masochistic part of my personality, you know, endurance sports. It's like I'm doing all the research, business school, getting the good grades, doing a prestigious fellowship, you know, working for these top companies. You know, one of my bosses was the CFO of uh, Roku, Steve Loudon. He took the company mm. public. And um, so really awesome mentors, doing all the research. And like I said, I get into running my own businesses. And it turns out that you can have one person who does all the research and one person who just goes all in and they both win and vice versa. Uh, they could both lose. And so there isn't that I can find necessarily a correlation between doing the research and taking the risk. It's more about having the right principles in place and being able to kind of consistently execute on that and really like play what I would say, play your game, lean into your strengths. Yeah. And you, and you had so many, I, I know you went through a bunch of different corporate gigs. And so you've learned, yeah, you've learned from that. You've learned from school, obviously your own personal just abilities and, and preferences, I guess, old preferences. Maybe mm-hmm. they are. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit on the preferences thing. Sure. Um, what was, was there like a moment in time where it shifted for you? Was there an occasion or an event? So uh, about seven years ago, I bought another business to kind of bolt onto an existing company. And again, did all the research search all the due diligence, just like I would when I was part of due diligence for you know, Fortune 500 acquisitions. Get into it. Couldn't be more of a disaster. Like Clients are just showing up at our office. They're like, oh, that's what I always used to do. I just show up. Like, things aren't scheduled. You just show up. The person I, uh, we, the leader of the company that we, we bought the business from, he was in the same building. And so he just wanted a little bit of a transition. So he's like, can I just set up a couple of things in one of your open office spaces just so I can be around on occasion to help you with the transitions. Like this sounds, thank you. Like that sounds great. Yeah. Give him a key, come in Monday. He's taken over the whole corner office, filled it. It's just like, oh, these massive bookcases. It's like, now you, it's like you're running the company now. They sent out this communication to all these folks. That, oh, don't worry, I'm still, you know, I'm still around. Uh, I had a huge crisis of confidence. What did I give myself? How did I miss all this stuff? What happened? And I just thought about maybe I need to sell this business. Maybe I need to go get a job. What am I doing? So I got connected to my now longtime mentor, this guy, Randy Massengale. And, and Randy was senior advisor to Bill Gates. So just sort of the level that he was playing at and the list goes on and on. And uh, I was introduced to him and the introduction was, you're just going to have to meet Randy. I can't really describe him. (laughs) And I sat down and for about an hour, he asked me a bunch of random questions, seemingly random questions to me, totally different than I I met with three or four other potential like coaches, mentors. And it was very, tell me about your business, revenue, what's your, you know, kind of the typical research stuff. Randy's asked me all these questions that people hadn't ever asked before. Do you have any like top of mind or something that stands out? We spent a lot of time talking about uh, playing basketball in like my cul-de-sac, like a lot of times awesome. talking about play, playing basketball. I'm sure that exposes a lot of your personality totally. and, and where you're flowing. And- a lot of time talking about, I had a speech problem as a kid, uh, really bad teeth. Like we're talking a, a, a lot about that. And just at the end of it, he proceeds to basically explain me at this level that nobody else had ever kind of nailed before. And I've had therapists before this, you know, had, yeah. and, uh, and he said, you know what your problem is? You're playing somebody else's game. I want to insert some <laughs> expletives after that because like, <laughs> as he unpacked it, it's like, yeah, I, I am. And the way that he kind of used things is your, 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 and I've kind of adopted this and talk about it in the book too, is uh, thinking back to your, your favorite sport or hobby as a kid. That's often, you know, ignore, ignoring maybe overbearing parents or certain socioeconomic conditions. That's often like the, the fullest expression of who you are. You get to show up. You get to pick the favorite sport or hobby, play the way you want to play. And and then every, the rest of the world is telling you to conform. Your traditional education is telling you to conform. I went to a Jesuit university. We got a, every class a full dose of what is morally just and what it means to be a good person and a good, and I, you know, I, that's important to me, be a good person. Of course. Um, but you end up trying to, to again play somebody else's game and my game is uh not the most athletically gifted person uh but i'm going to put in the i want to take the last shot like i want the ball in my hands i want to put up a lot of shots i'm not afraid to dive on the floor like kind of hustle player uh and so when i'm doing the uh, uh, delegating and seeking consensus and 
looking for other people to give me answers. I'm no longer playing my game. Uh, as simple as that is, it's like an easy way to just reorient. I'm playing someone else's game. Of course, I'm unhappy right now. Mm. How do I get back to that? So kind of a long-winded story, but that was like a major turning point in my entire life. It makes so much sense, and I relate to it in a lot of ways. And I, I'm thinking of confidence, the root of all of this. You know, buying that business, your confidence was shook. And I mean, I could bring in so much anxiety, stressors, whatever mm -hmm. you want to list. I mean, it's you start second guessing yourself and, and everything that's led you to this point. And and yeah, you're playing someone else's game because you're not living in your own reality anymore. Mm -hmm. You've kind of put the blinders and all that. And um, yeah, I can relate to a lot of what you're saying in that, like, I think of the favorite times where I'm playing sports or how I would play, I would trust myself. And like you said, yeah, take the last shot or just go big or maybe just kind of go it alone on, on whatever it might be. That's why I did a lot of running mm -hmm. marathon type yeah, stuff too. Yeah. But I believed in myself. But I could see in those so times. it's not coincidental that you're not running this podcast alone. <laughs> That's right. Well, I'm standing up right now. So I'm on a <laughs> Are you ready to go? Uh, no, not on a trip. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, yeah, you, you're, when confidence is shook, and I know I've experienced this even recently a little bit, you know, it's that reminder like, whoa, hold on, that is something else, someone else, mm -hmm. an external thing that is shaking something in me that I forgot about or maybe wasn't aware yeah. of. Yeah, you mentioned preferences earlier, and yeah. a few years before having this conversation with Randy, I had a, a therapist who I, was helping me with my people-pleasing tendencies, and uh he kept saying, Dan, when are you going to realize you already have all the answers? I kept thinking like, that's cool, but that feels very arrogant. I have all the answers. I don't have all the answers. And it took me the, the moment for Randy to realize, like, well, I do have all the answers because all the questions I'm, I'm asking are preferences. It depends. Yep. And what does it depend on? It depends on what I want. So I'm the only one that can actually answer that. So I don't have all the answers in terms of IT or legal or these technical things, but only I can kind of navigate or, or sort of architect my future because it's what I want. And I was constantly looking for the person to give me that that secret or that next step. And then it wouldn't work out. The checklist. Because I, yeah. I was playing their game. And I realized this funny irony, and I see this with so many business owners, where I ask them, hey, why did, why did you go into business to begin with? And you get some version of, I wanted freedom, like freedom to, to find my own destiny, financial freedom, some version of freedom. And you're like, okay, that's interesting. T totally makes sense to me. You want freedom. Now, why are you conforming to what everyone else is telling you? You actually became incredibly exploitable. I used to be incredibly exploitable because I was in so much pain playing everyone else's game that I was falling victim to that one step or that one funnel, that one hack that I'm just so, just give me that answer. And you become in those moments of pain, easily exploitable. Someone can sell you this tip, but it doesn't actually, you're not actually clear on what you want. And so it gets you further away. So to me, this work is really about becoming less exploitable. And this, uh, it reminds me of, I think it's how you intro the book is uh, mindset and this, like this layer of mindset that a lot of coaching or courses that we see out there, mm. uh, we don't need to name any names, <laughs> I just really want to, <laughs> but yep. uh, the whole point is that it, it's a lot of, is, is like, oh, it's your mindset. You know, it's not the, this is fault or this external thing. It's you. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that tends to be the, I gave you the, I gave you the secret. You didn't get results. That's on you. Fix your mindset. And there, there is some truth to that, because if you are actually conforming and playing someone else's game, you need to fix that. Stop doing that. But it's also an easy out for people to not actually deliver on their promises because they're they're blaming they're blaming you. It's, I, I kind of view it as a there's some truth to it because you played someone else's game. But at the same point, it's kind of a cop out. Yeah, yeah, definitely kind of both there. And this where. I, what I want to get into is getting more clarity over the things that make us feel bad, I guess. For, mm. for, you know, and that's anxiety, anxiety, uh, stresses, guilt, shame, all these things. And it seems like, well, you put anxiety into a formula, which I thought was kind of cool. Yeah. Um, you know, very simple. It's uncertainty times powerlessness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And I would love for you to unpack what that means and also define what certainty is and how mm -hmm. that can kind of flip the whole game around. Yeah. Do you mind if I give a little bit of context? Because there's, there's a fair amount to answering that question. And I, I definitely encourage you to interrupt <laughs> interrupt me for, for okay. clarification. Yeah. So, so I have one of my businesses is a CPA firm. And our whole thing has been showing people how to pay less in tax. But if you're just, how do I show you how to pay less in tax? You're kind of a commodity because there's lots of people that show you how to pay less in tax. And is it that people, what is it that someone really wants? Why do you want to pay less in tax? Because they want to fund their, they want to live the life that they want. They want to take that money and not give it to the IRS and 
put it towards the things they actually want. And so I started to realize that every client I was working with had one thing in common. It didn't matter if they were a startup or they were a nine, 10 figure client. And they were all wondering, am I going to be okay? You know, like, how could someone that's a billionaire be worried about if they're going to be okay? Well, it's sort of that more money, more problems thing where now they got 20 houses and all these expenses and layers and layers and layers, and they may not have a lot of liquidity and might not have access to cash. They've got things tied up in hard assets. So they still have stress. It's a different kind of stress, but it's still the same inherent, am I going to be okay? Just different levels. And then I came to understand that anxiety is really this worrying about the future. So I think about Depression is kind of thinking and feeling bad about decisions. Maybe bad's not the right term, but about the past and anxiety being sort of this future focus. Like that's how I understand it. That's how it's explained to me. Like, okay, well, am I going to be okay is really a future focus thing. It's There's an anxiety component to it. Does that make sense? It does, perfectly. So that's sort of how I conceptualize it. Again, I'm not a cl clinical psychologist or anything like that, but I try to simplify things into frameworks that my brain can get <laughs> its arms around. It works. Arms around. Yeah. So am I going to be okay? The essential question that every client was asking me. Now, I believe that if you're a marketer, a copywriter, operations, et cetera, your client is also wondering, am I going to be okay? Mm -hmm. It's just a different lens, but it's the same problem. It's anxiety. And so I heard this, this equation from this guy, Chip Conley, and he says, anxiety equals uncertainty times powerlessness. Kind of knocked me over. Okay. I've been trying to help sort of figure out how to articulate this anxiety thing to clients. Uncertainty times powerlessness. So I can, if I can, sh so then because I'm a math nerd, mm -hmm. I think this is third grade math, distributed property, you go, okay, financial anxiety equals financial uncertainty times financial powerlessness. Or marketing anxiety equals marketing uncertainty times marketing powerlessness. Crypto anxiety or operate, you know, it's an infinite number of combinations. So really what we're trying to do is give them more certainty and more power over the situation. And the output of that is less anxiety. And that was sort of the, the underpinnings of what has become almost my life's mission, life's work. How do I help people have more certainty? Now in the financial world, you're not supposed to say financial certainty. Like if I was a registered investment advisor, it's like you can't say financial certainty. So that actually made it more interesting to me. I'm not a registered financial advisor. It's a CPA, I can say it. Like, um, I can sort of maybe own this term a bit. So I decided certainty is getting what you want on your terms without compromise. So that's my definition of certainty. And so then we have to be clear on what we want. We have to be clear on our timeline. And then without compromise, we have to be clear on who we are. In other words, we need to play our game. If we get to the end of it and we have all the money, but we're somebody else, we end up blowing ourselves up anyways. Let's get what we want on our terms without compromise. There's so much there. And this is where, yeah, it is like an onion. Yeah, like yeah. Each, each one of these things, they all relate to each other, but you're, you just keep peeling away the layers. And I think you started off things with kind of defining that, uh, you know, both, both certainty and anxiety and how to kind of deconstruct all of it to flip it around. Because mm -hmm. I think that's what really hooked me, to be honest, Dan, is, is it's, it made a lot of sense because internally, you know, I'm doing mm -hmm. these checks and, and thinking about it, writing these notes. I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Felt that, feel that <laughs> or whatever it is. Yeah. And the, the thing I, I started to think about was going back to preferences is figuring out, okay, what is it that I want? And knowing that, you know, that might change over time and, having that, that grace with that, you know, and knowing that things are, are going to change, you know, our seasons uh -huh. of our life, we're get, we are going to change and there are 100%. things like that. So, um, the, I'm curious to go down that, that path, but also, and you can go in whatever order you want with the biases that you brought up that we all kind of have in yeah. us. Yeah. So there's a, there's a, um, there is kind of an onion and you can keep pulling this back, uh, many, many layers. To me, what we want is an infinite game. And there's so much around things like Parkinson's law. I have something in the book I call High Month Paradigm. There's so many things around how, uh, and back to more dopamine of more, that we think we know what we want, and then we uh, get closer to it and it changes. And I have this anecdote about working with a client. They inherited a farm in Ohio with a bunch of debt. And we're talking to them about their what do you want in your timeline? And they go, well, my number one priority, I push people, like, tell me what your number one priority is so we can optimize. Like, I want to pay off this debt on this really weighing on me. Like, that makes sense. So we look at re recovering resources, reallocating things to try to achieve that. And they, and we show, like, hey, you can do these three things and you can pay off your, your farm right now. And they go, thank you. I'm going to move to California. <laughs> the number three goal was move to California. And instead, so instead of once she never thought that was going to be possible, but once she saw 
the actual resources, she, I call it voting with your money, she got clear on what she really wanted. And so I just use as an example of it's an infinite game. What you think you want keeps evolving as you get new information. We have to have the humility to kind of reserve the right to change our mind. But just accept that. You shouldn't feel any shame or guilt. That's just part of it. And I think that's a, that's a well, I know it's a very freeing feeling, especially as entrepreneurs that feel like, yeah, we, we're good enough or I'm smart enough, whatever. I have the, you know, the people around me or, or Gary in the book is a good reference. You know, like <laughs> that guy over there, my friend. Read, Gary. Yeah, damn you, Gary. Yeah. I hate that guy. I um, try to make Gary the Karen, the male Karen. That's yeah. my... <laughs> I like it. I like it. Yeah, it it flo- it, it resonated because everybody has a Gary in their minds, a friend or someone <laughs> on social media that they idolize for whatever freaking reason yeah. that uh, we all know is bad. But at the same time, our monkey brains in here kind of keep going back to Karen or Gary. There's, yeah. I think it's commandment two, where you're talking about preferences versus binary decisions. Mm-hmm. And that really, I related to that a ton because of the guilt and shame of this or that good or bad. Um, you know, it has to, the shoulds, you know, just the term shoulds. Yeah. There's a lot of weight to that if, if that's how we make our decisions. So I'm curious of how that would play into preferences after we define them. Yeah. So, so I believe that we are all biased. I think there's a lot of neuroscience on this. You can read something like Thinking Fast and Slow from Dr. Daniel Kahneman. He establishes some science behind how we have this system that's really fast, but it's got all these biases. And then we've got a system of our brain that's slow that we have more control over. And so we're all biased. The internet is filled with people going, look at this biased person, but I'm, look at me, I'm reasonable and rational and so on. And like, no, we're all <laughs> Not biased. Bad. Yeah. Uh, there's something called GI Joe bias. It says, even when you know about the biases, you're still subject to them. And even when you know, you know, you're still subject to that. We're all biased. There are some things in the world that are facts, binary. There's a right and there's a wrong. My daughter asks me, one of my daughter, why is the sky blue? I can, there's some science, some facts. Uh, I can Google and get the answer to. Turns out that most of the questions at least business owners are asking are actually preferences. Should I grow my business? Should I do this podcast solo? You could ask, I don't know what your process was, but you could ask 20 people, probably get 20 slightly different answers. Some people are like, there's only one way to think about this. If you don't do this, you're an idiot. Other people maybe are like, I don't know. You thought about these five things. You could Google it. Should I do this podcast on my own? I don't know how many hundred, how many millions of hits you might get. The point is that you just get a bunch of opinions back. They just might look like facts. They're preferences. Only you can really answer that. Now, what I want to say is when some people hear me say that, it gives them a tremendous amount of anxiety because they're like, but there's, because they're like a previous version of me that's like, but there's still a right answer because somehow I'm going to, got to get an A on this test. Yeah, I understand what you're telling me, but no, there's still like a right way to do it. So where do I get that answer? Again, there is a right answer, which is what do you want? And so once you embrace that you get to write all the rules and you truly embrace that, you have so much more freedom, so much more freedom than living in the world where you thought you wanted freedom, but then you're looking for everyone else to give you the right answers and the next steps and the consensus. So much freedom. But you have to get over that anxiety first. The anxiety and I just feel, yeah, the cognitive overload, you know, with, with mm-hmm. all these options, but without us knowing what our personal preferences are, maybe identifying some of these biases in us that we... Mm-hmm are more proponent, you know, are more like inclined to maybe lean towards in certain Mm -hmm. situations or when we're stressed. Yeah. I mean, it's, it takes work. It takes a lot of work, man. Yeah. And I guess, you know, because there's that, I forget what it's called exactly, but there's a gap between, you know, a a stimulus and a response. And Uh it's, it's like mind the gap is what I always kind of remind myself. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm curious yeah, because that, that defines everything. It's how we show up in the world so we can we can talk it, think it all we want. Yeah. But yeah, it's that gap. So I have a, I have a couple of thoughts that might be helpful to, to listeners because I've, I've gone through this whole path. Okay. So most of the book is like, could be summarized as 20, Dan struggling for 20 years and trying to come up with solutions to his struggles and problems. Thanks for sharing. So <laughs> that, might be the, that might be the summary. Discipline. Okay. Entrepreneurship, heavy, a lot of dialogue got to be disciplined and we just had you know this is we're recording this on february 1st hope you don't mind me saying that so we're not that far away from uh new year's resolution and i asked people like how many of your new year's resolutions were some version of just being more disciplined Mm -hmm. but i've got the answer people are like all of them Uh, yeah yeah. (laughs) all of them and you're like okay what is what is it going to take for you to be more disciplined and they're like i just i'm just going to be more disciplined it's like so the thing that you need to be more disciplined is more disciplined oh yeah I'm trying to be more disciplined by having more discipline. 
Like I'm kind of running this race against myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the answer is look to the opposite, which is how do I put myself in these positions where I don't have to be more disciplined? So I, I'm a big fan of Dr. Jeff Span Spencer. We have a lot of overlap. He's big on restraint. Let me see the keyword champions playbook is restraint. So people hear him talk and then they're inspired as they should be. And then I'll talk to them and they're like, yeah, uh, I need to have more restraint. Okay. You missed Dr. Jeff's entire message is that you need to put yourself in a position where you're less impulsive or you're not so impulsive all the time uh, so that you don't need to be constantly looking for more restraint. And so it ends up, we end up back to the same uh, kind of closer versus more type discussion, which is in a personal best type narratives. It's kind of all the same, yep. which is I keep setting up all these mental models and narratives where I just have to do more of everything, more disciplined, more restraint. Like, no, you kind of need to do the opposite. You need to pull a, a George Costanza from Seinfeld and do the opposite. Uh, don't put yourself in so many positions where you have to be where you have to exercise restraint. Try to find uh, scenarios where you don't have to be so disciplined. In other words, eliminate all the bad things so that you're just left with good things. And that's really how we engineer luck. I call it creating asymmetry to the upside, which is like a very my trading derivative background. But it's another version of it. you get rid of all the bad things, then all you're left is good things. Yeah. So you don't have to be disciplined all the time. And I'll tee that 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 asymmetry to the upside because that that was my favorite commandment throughout this all and mm. i think it relates to what uh dr jeff spencer would shout out because he was a uh, he was on the podcast a lot oh, right loved, loved his uh his episode is the champion mindset compared to just the human mindset or i think mm -hmm. i think you yep. defined it differently but, human mindset. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah and, and with the yeah with the human side you know that we are all equipped with for better or for worse is very impulsive you know, and there's mm -hmm. that we're not minding gaps. We're tripping over them. We're jumping over them. We're not even thinking about it. And then you have the champion side, which is a, pretty much the opposite. You know, there's systems, there's restraint is kind of built into every layer of that mm -hmm. thing. And it's defined really well. And that's where I feel like it relates perfectly to that asymmetry to the upside commandment four, where you, you could be a smart gambler. It's kind of like how I took it. You know, like all yeah. of us entrepreneurs are gamblers. We're all taking massive risks that our parents probably thought were insane. I know my mom did. Um, <laughs> yeah. Still does probably, but, yeah. um, but we're doing it with, with, you know, with restraint and, and clarity. I'm curious of your thoughts around that commandment there. Yeah, I, I think when you really study the great entrepreneurs, I like to look at things in the extremes because often that's when principles is fall apart is in the extremes. And I look at the notion of risk in the extreme and I go, you know, Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, Oprah Winfrey, whatever, may, pick your favorite kind of billionaires who've really done well, Sarah Blakely. They're naturally good at finding opportunities that have way more upside than downside. If this doesn't work, I'm out this investment. But if it does work, I've got such a huge runway. And they typically have gone so far as to kind of eliminate a lot of the, the downsides. So what do we take from that? Well, us normal humans like myself, I'm not naturally gifted at finding opportunities that have huge asymmetry. So I have to work at it. I need to think through like, what are the downsides? What are the bad things that could happen? And what could I do to eliminate them? And so a lot of the, after the commandments of the book are tools and principles and systems to try to eliminate downside. Because again, back to dopamine and more, we're not wired to look for the downsides. We're wired to go, I better do this now because I'm going to miss out and I got to jump on that. Right. Yep. So we systematically remove the bad things so that we're only left with good things. And the people who I see who consistently win in business, they either have a system where they eliminate the downside or they naturally do it. And they're just not aware of it. They're not actually huge risk takers when you weigh the, the downside versus the upside. They just kind of embody it somehow. Yeah. Now marketers, the charlatans out there, they use the idea of betting on yourself and they use the extreme examples of the billionaires to sell their programs. And again, if you're not clear in what you want, you're very exploitable. You might be getting all the scrutiny and expectations from your family. You got to prove to them that you're right. And so you buy into all these things about like burn the boat. So are, have you heard this burn the boat? I fortunately use that term when we did a big pivot in our business uh, last year. So, um, but yes, please go on because it smacked me right between the eyes. And uh, you heard, you've heard my anecdote on this. I've heard yours, but please share. It. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, not trying to dunk on you at all. Please um, do. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. So in the 1500s, Cortez he sails across the sea in a battle. This is the backstory to burn the boats. He gets there, uh, and it looks like imminent 
do? Like we're outnumbered and what do we do? So he burns the boats. So he gives his uh, his warriors no other chance but to go and fight and they go on and they win the war. And so entrepreneurs, many have kind of taken that narrative to go, well, you got to go all in, you got to bet on yourself. Now, the, there's one really important, and so, so the narrative is like, go all in, you got to take risk, bet on yourself. Now, there's one really important detail that's left out of this story. Do you already know where I'm going with this? I, I do, but I'm not going to yeah. ruin it. Yeah. <laughs> and this really important detail is that Cortez is told before he leaves in the battle, if you return and you're not victorious, we will deem you a traitor and you will all be killed. So he actually chose when he arrives in battle, he decides to burn the boats. He chose the least risky option. It's actually not an example about uh, taking all the risk. It's actually an example about taking the least amount of risk, right? I at least have a chance to win this war, but if I go home, I'm dead. I'm dead either way. Yeah. A hundred percent. So one option actually gives me a chance of survival. Not a great chance, but at least a chance. And so I uh, share that story as a timeless principle about trying to at all times eliminate the downside risk so that you're only left with upside. And to me, that's how you engineer luck or what I would call read the game. Man. Yeah. I read that. I did not know the backstory before your book and read that. And I'm like, yeah, I've, I've said that term, definitely not knowing <laughs> what the heck the backstory was. And yeah, it's just the opposite. And most of us don't. So like I said, uh, I appreciate the humility on your part. <laughs> not don't try me. But... I took it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, this is where it makes a lot of sense. And it seems like to kind of put everything in a nice package is you're, you're showing people a very proven model, something that anyone can follow along without being a mathematician, accountant, whatever you mm-hmm. might, may or may, may not be out there. Um, it's, it's reduce risk and effort, minimize those and optimize the upside or optionality and apply that all over the place. I mean, there's just countless examples of how that can be applied in life and business. So the the outcome to me is I want people to get, I want people to live the life that they want and I want to help people eliminate suffering. And there's so many entrepreneurs out there who are suffering because they back themselves into a corner where everything requires maximum effort because they took on maximum risk and they have no options. And it's a really terrible place to be. I've been there before, right? Even though I've gone to business, like I said, I went to business school. I've been mentored by some of the best in business. I've been there multiple times. I don't even want to tell you how many times I've been there. I've had to reorient and relearn and go, least amount of effort. Now, my least amount of effort and Joe, your least amount of effort is probably still 100 times more effort than the average person, but it's least relative to all options. And your least amount of risk is probably a hundred times more risky than the average person, but it's relative to all the options, right? Because when we do that, we take the least amount of effort, least amount of risk, we're left with options and we need to have options. That's our personal freedom right there in a nutshell. That's the freedom. Man. Well, that's the freedom. I love it. Dan, uh, you give so many tools. I mean, everyone should start with your book, Rigging the Game. Go find it at, was it riggingthegame.com? Is that the best place? You can go to riggingamazon.com. It'll take you right to uh, right to the checkout. Right on. So, yeah, I keep right hoping on. the book is successful enough that Amazon sends me a cease and desist letter for owning riggingamazon.com. But <laughs> we'll... Uh, Hey, wait till that day comes. Who cares? Well, yeah. That'll be a great day. I'll let you know. It will be. Thank you. And uh, and go check out the Rigging the Game podcast as well. Uh, I know you do CCA. That's more of the coaching program you have. You all have a whole bunch of tools. Certainty app, I believe, is so that all this stuff goes hand in hand. If you if you thought all connected, it. yeah, yep. yeah. The wait was it was worth it, Dan. I'm happy I had you on here, and I hope this. Yeah, me too helps a lot of people because yeah, we're on the same mission, man. It's, it's uh, in that suffering for entrepreneurs. It can go bad places. So it's a good life. Well, thanks for having me on. I appreciate the work that you're doing and helping people in this, what I would say, uh, ending, ending the suffering and entrepreneurship. I appreciate you too. All right. All right. That's what I got for you today. And remember, it's not all about living to work. Ah, ah, ah. It's all about working to live if you need to do the work, but you know, work can be fun and it should be fueling for your life. So if you enjoyed what you just heard, if you got some nuggets of wisdom that you want to share or you're just noodling on right now, please go tell others the way that people find this show and how you can help others get their aha moments is through word of mouth. So if it is telling your friend, telling your family, send an email to your list, writing a review or whatever it might be, everything helps. So thank you so much for listening to the Hustle and Flowchart podcast and I will see you next time.